Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Crit Hala podcast. I am your host for this evening, Ol Skitflack, and I am joined by my valiant and honorable co-host here. We'll start with Soto Stavi. Stavi, what's going on, buddy? How are you? I'm doing great, old Skip Flack of the Skip Flack clan. Oh, such an honorable Ooh. man. <laughs> yes, quite welcome. Bow before me. <laughs> what did I just walk into? Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, well, you just walked into the podcast. Uh, this is also our other co-host, Mike Cosmic Key. What's going on, bud? <laughs> um, hi, uh, bow before me. How's everybody going? Bow before that's not very honorable of you. That's not honorable. That's, that's like evil well, as hell. <laughs> to be fair, I said the it, same thing. So <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, why is it evil for is it is it the goggles? Why is it evil for me? And I don't know, maybe because he's like an it's, old. It's wizard. the goggles. Yeah, the robes give me like a like a flare of of sort of regality that you <laughs> lack. <laughs> It's okay, it comes with age. When you get a beard like this, man, you could do whatever you want, trust me. Whatever the hell you want. <laughs> whatever All right, you want. I can't, I can't, I want to argue, but I can't, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome back to the Crit Hollow podcast. Um, yeah, welcome back, guys. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Yeah, welcome back. Thank you guys so much for checking us out, uh, as usual. Um, our last episode, as as usual, did really well. Thank you guys Woo! so much for checking us out. However, if this is the first time you're checking out the Crit Hala podcast, first of all, welcome. We run a show on here called DMs Discuss, where every episode we discuss a specific Dungeon Master-related question. Ooh. Yeah. So, we're, we're going to get into that. But also, we have... Um, our last episode, we uh, we asked uh, our, our listeners uh, questions... And we actually got a late question that we're going to discuss at the very end of the podcast. So make sure you stay tuned for that because it's actually a pretty interesting one. However, today we have a fun, fun subject to cover. What is it, all? Well, before that, if you don't know, and if you're new here, we also have a YouTube channel where we post the video version of the podcast. And we always have a setting for that. So, our setting for this episode is a war-torn wasteland. <gasps> My robes! <laughs> They're getting dirty! No, I have to hike them up! <laughs> stand on the rock. Just stand on the rock. Uh, where is there? The rock has blood on it, damn it. Ooh, ooh that must be oh, dried sorry. blood. If I, if I just spit on it... <laughs> <laughs> Rub just it out. Wipe it off. Yeah, yeah just rub it. Fun. Mr. Mr. Clean it. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is much better. M much better. This is much better. We are in some uh, forgotten, worn, torn lands. There was a there's a war here generations ago to the point where nobody even remembers what kind of war has happened here. And uh, as as we're all uh, trudging through here, um, trying to get to our, our our next destination, all of a sudden. A surprise attack from behind. Ah! Stavi, nah. you you play um Stavi the sneaky. You are a rogue. Mike, you are playing um uh, Mike the wise. Uh, Stranger Things reference. Haha, <laughs> that's funny. You're you're playing oh, a funny yeah. little wizard. <laughs> <laughs> and I am playing I uh, a, a, a valiant paladin. Uh, roll initiative. Go. Fuck. Wait, why am I the rogue? I'm actually a wizard. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just spicing it up. Yeah, no, that's fine. I don't mind being a rogue. What's do I have a dex bonus? No, you have nothing. Fuck. Yeah, I have we're, a all, we're all one. Yeah, all right, I got a two. So, Mike, what'd you get? I'm wise and really slow. I actually rolled a one. Oh, fantastic! Don't worry, boys. The rogue got this. All right, rogue boy. He's he's a he's a tall man, red beady eyes. He's wearing this <gasps> big, big burly furry coat, and he's looking like he wants some trouble. <gasps> Papa. <laughs> is that you, <laughs> Papa? Oh Have no! You returned, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> the side quest has started. <laughs> oh no, dude! My Fight background. What you didn't know was that this was an intervention. All your family is here. Bring them out. Yeah. <laughs> Bring them out. <laughs> oh no! It's like Mori. <laughs> okay. Um. Okay. Uh, we're on a battlefield. Uh, is it misty out? Is it's it a like little, a, it's a little? It's a little misty out. Okay, I want to attempt to hide in plain sight using okay. the using the weather. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm gonna roll. Oh, 17. Oh man, that's definitely gonna be enough. 
Okay, so does he notice me when I kind of, like, shift into the mist? Absolutely not. He's actually setting his gaze on uh, Mike the Wise at the moment, so he has not noticed you at all. Do I notice that his gaze is on Mike the Wise? You do. Okay, I want to use my movement action to sneak up behind him, and I want to sneak attack him, but by tickling. Okay, yeah, yeah, go for it. He's only 20 feet away, so you're good. Cool. I get up behind him, and I roll for sneak attack. I got a 14. That is enough. Absolutely. Yes. Cool. So I want to. I want to. Um. I want to tickle him literally to death. <laughs> you can absolutely go for that. He's gonna roll a con save. Sure. Which, uh, he rolls a three. So that is definitely <gasps> not enough. Absolutely yes. not. He starts falling on the ground, laughing as you're just <laughs> on top of him, tickling his little bum. <laughs> <laughs> I have out. a look of like evil in my face, like evil intent. Like this is not play time. I'm genuinely trying to tickle him to death. That sounds erotic. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna go now. Uh, I I see that you're you're on top of him. Take he is incapacitated. I'm going in for a big swing with my warhammer. Uh, here we go. Uh, yeah, thirteen. That'll hit. I just literally just smash him right on top of the face with my with with shiny glowing radiant light coming from my warhammer. Just boom, knock him out. But he's still laughing. He's 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 having a great time, honestly. Mike the Wise. I'm actually happy for him. I'm happy that he's having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> is he is he like laughing but dead? Or he's alive. he's he, he, you you can tell he's basically done, but he's still having a great time. Oh, um, let's see. So he's on top of him. You're wailing at his head like it's a croquet game. Um, yeah. I guess I'll attack his feet. That's all that's oh, exposed. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to. Let's see. I'm very wise. Yeah, extremely wise. I take out my spell book and. I hobble his ankles with it. <laughs> <laughs> what is this, misery? <laughs> <laughs> so the whole spell book? Yeah, just the whole spell. I'm just going to hit him with it. Okay. <laughs> I cast book right on your right ankle. Ah! So I'm going to roll, um, I'm going to roll, uh, unexpected, uh, attack. Okay, yeah, go for 18. it. 18! Dude, that totally... Ooh. With him being incapacitated, absolutely. You go for it. So you just start wailing on his ankles. With the, I, This is such a scene. This is such a scene. You have... His head is being smashed in. His body's being tickled. His, his feet are being slapped <laughs> around by a book. You know, some people have to pay for this kind of That's true. treatment. You that know, is so true. <laughs> he, he, should be, he should be grateful for what we're doing today. <laughs> and as he lets out his last breath, he just slightly lets out a little <laughs> and dies. Congratulations. No. You got through an encounter. Congrats, everyone. Woo. Congrats. Yeah. I high five Mike the Wise. I high five back. <laughs> <laughs> I say a quick blessing, and we all walk off into the distance ready for our next encounter. And I say, was that really your dad? <laughs> no, but no, I looked in his wallet. We have we have different names. Oh. oh. Yeah. Do you have any money? In his wallet? He had, like, three shillings and, like, an old, uh, like, bread tack ration. That's it. Ew. I think he was homeless. Oh. I think we killed a homeless man. Oh, I guess that's why they call us murder hobos. But um bum Oh! <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, this is an episode about encounters. Huzzah! Yes. Huzzah! That was a really long-winded way of getting into that. I did not think it'd take that long. But <laughs> normally, when you're running an encounter, you never really think it's going to take that long. Am I right? <laughs> Absolutely yeah. true. Sometimes it gets away from you. Also, I said Mike the Wise, even though it's Will the Wise, Stranger Things reference. That was... Whatever. Anyway, welcome to our encounters. Episode. I got it. Um... I feel like this will be a really interesting one because a lot of us have uh, not like differencing opinions, but we come from different backgrounds in terms of how to run encounters. Sure. So, and it's it's a it, just talking about encounters is really general. But this all started um, with actually our previous podcast, which you should totally check out. We because we, we we talked about what do we prefer encounters or uh, role playing situations, and. I, I kind of started grinding my gears on that, and I was like, I think we could really have like a whole podcast dedicated to this. So 
I wanted to start off. We have a, I have a couple of of questions, so I figured we'd start off with one and then continue on to the next. I like the sound of that. Cool. Also, I look for another rock to stand on. Okay. Because it, this this battlefield actually sucks, dude. Like, do you have any idea how much it costs to get these ropes laundered? Yeah, I mean, it's disgusting. It's generations old. So there's just like bones and like Ugh. oh, and there's fungus, rust, what the rusty weapons, and it's dusty as hell. It's getting all over your robe, bro. I'm sorry. Oh my god, why I'm did so we come sorry. here? We're trying to get to our what? next location. I don't know. Maybe we're trying to. I don't know. You know, this is the last time. <laughs> sure, sure. But Mike, <laughs> I'm taking the map next time, dude. This is. I don't know where you led us, Magellan, but this is this is screwed up. Wait, I was supposed to have the map. You don't have the map? No, I just said that way. We don't need the map. I follow the Holy Spirit. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I follow with my human eyes, see. <laughs> I follow my Not heart. Not very far. Yeah. <laughs> the glow of my hammer leads the way. Anyway. <laughs> so, the first question I have um, is, uh, in terms of encounters, how do you enjoy structuring your encounters um do you prefer like maybe just going by the book or do you enjoy um homebrewing encounters you know kind of make making your own rules or changing things up yeah so first off when it comes to D D, and anybody who has ever played it either as a player or a dm knows that very few things are actually done by the book. <laughs> True. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, you can have the rules are only just a suggestion, man. Like none of none of this is actually, you know, set in stone for sure. Yeah, technically the rules can stop at that first introduction chapter that says all you need is a pencil, some dice, paper and an imagination, and that's it. Yeah. That's it. That's all you that's need. Literally it. So as for encounters, I mean, so I absolutely homebrew everything. I, I, I genuinely do. Um, some of the elements that I like to put in to, to my encounters, I don't know if we're going to talk about this at all. If we are, I'll go more into detail later. But um, aside from just having a target, I also like to have environmental risks, uh, whether it's difficult terrain or like a timed trap so they have to get through the encounter by either killing whatever it is that they're fighting or running away before the time uh, runs out and they turn into a Jill sandwich. Um, Resident Evil reference for 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 those of the, the old school. One. No, thank you. Yeah, I love you. I love you for it, man. Stuff like that, or even or even just like weather effects. You know, like um, if you're fighting like a bunch of elven or elvish archers, you know, maybe I'll have like a storm wind kind of kick up, which will make them more uh, inaccurate, um, which will cause another person from their ranks to come forward that that might not be affected by the wind like maybe they have mages in the background who are only there for support and then like this wind kicks up and now the archers are ineffective so now the mages step forward now you have to deal with mages instead of archers which can become you know so dynamically shifting um encounters is something that i i definitely like to do i also like a like to have uh slight rp in it right you know because not everything that you're gonna fight is gonna want to fight to the death and i think that's a, a, a misconception that a lot of specifically fifth edition players have um not to call anybody out but i see this a lot like on the reddit and stuff when people are asking about these sort of things if you're fighting like a bandit very few bandits are actually going to fight to the death. They're really only just attacking you out of necessity, right? They're poor. They're desperate. They're looking for food. They're looking for money. They're looking for a way to stay alive as like a bandit clan. Right. But very few of them are actually going to fight to the very death. Have your guys run away. Have your players chase after them. Create like a chase sequence because that in itself could also be an, an encounter just – you know, and then and then you're rolling for like athletic checks to see if you jump over the tree or you know like a quick time event sort of, but like for tabletop. Yeah. Um, which is actually kind of cool. I, I kind of want to do something like that. But yeah, everything is everything is homebrewed for me personally. That's that's how I do it. Um, what about you guys? So for me, I like um, in terms of encounters, um, I tend to mostly play it by the book. Um, there has been some situations where I've made 
interesting encounters, which is something we'll get into later. Um, you know, like fun ways you've made uh, encounters interesting. Um, but in terms of like just normal combat, um, I tend to keep it by the book, but I absolutely encourage my players to do things that are fun. I always I always go into a D&D session where here's an encounter and you can fight it the way it normally goes. But if you come up with something interesting, I will absolutely allow it. Like I I used to do it all the time as a player where right. we would we would fight um, a monster or something. And here I am asking about what's in the environment. What can I use to maybe maybe I can swing on a on a branch and jump on top of the monster and hit it in the back of the neck or something for maybe a couple extra damage or something like that, because the creativity really keeps encounters interesting. Oh, for sure. Rule yeah. of cool, man. Exactly. The exactly. rule of cool is important. And there and there's players that they just want to, you know, they want to go crazy. They want to do their combos. They want to do their big attacks. And hey, uh, that's totally fine. You you can play an encounter however you want. But I absolutely encourage make things interesting as much as you can. If you want to come up with a crazy idea, I am so here for it. I, I'll I'll tell you what you want what what you got to roll for it. And if you make it, you make it. And if you don't, well, maybe come up with another idea later on. But most of the time, structurally, my encounters tend to stay on track in terms of book, more or less. Right on. What about you, Mike? Usually, I'm pretty much improv when it comes to encounters. Because I try not to have too much... I mean, there's structure in the sense that I know something's going to happen, but the second that happens, there's just too many variables for me to keep things on track. So I try to feed off of what the players are doing back and forth and back and forth. And if you're doing that enough, you really can't do it by the book because the players don't play by the book. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and I usually let my players pretty much do what they want. I've had players go like, well, what can I do here? And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And they're like, what can I do? And I was like, what do you want to do? Like, the D tell the DM, me specifically, if I'm running it, uh, what do you want to do? And I will assign a role to it. And if it's out, if it's beyond the pale, like, you know, I just ask my god for a lightning bolt. I'm like, well, you're first level. Your god doesn't know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to say no to that. Yeah. But... Um, and using the environment is a must, like adding weather, uh, terrain. Mm -hmm. If you're fighting bandits on the side of the road, there could be other travelers that get caught up into it. There's like, you know, the world is a chaotic place. Things happen all the time. The, the only thing I would say is like, don't put too much chaos into an encounter. And otherwise it just, it feels like a, a very special episode of a show. And like, there's like 17 special guest stars. And I'm like, well, how did you get here? So just within reason. Yeah, and and let that let that be like a lesson to any of the D and D players who listen to our podcasts or watch our podcast videos on YouTube, uh, which you can subscribe to right now. Go for it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, don't don't a uh, little bit of advice from the Grand Wizard man here. Okay, <laughs> um, ask your DM what you can like. Can I do this? Like, ask what is around me? What, you know, can can I attempt this? Can I attempt that? And if you have a very, you know, accommodating DM, somebody who's been doing it for a while, or just generally somebody who's willing to see some cool shit happen in the campaign, more often than not, they're going to, like Mike said, assign a role to it. Okay, well, you want to swing from the chandelier, do a backflip and kick the, the evil cleric out of the, you know, 15th story chapel window and then ride his body down like a scene from Bayonetta all the way to the <laughs> ground. Sure, man. Why not? <laughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah. Cool. Let's do it. Um, but ask questions. Can I do this? What yeah. is around me? You know, um, what can I interact with? Like that sort of thing. That's that's a very good point to touch on, Mike. Yeah. I've been I've been running for so long. I want to be surprised. So mm -hmm. like if I'm running the game outside of the box and I'm I'm trying to be as creative as possible, you know, give it back. Like, like bring that back to the table. And as a player, it, like, surprise me. 
Like, I'd be like, that's all I want to be like, that's awesome. Yeah, that so happened. Like, right. I want those moments. Yeah, DMs are players too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't we want to be that. entertained. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the more yeah. crazy shit you can come up with during an encounter, the more fun that we are going to have with setting up even future encounters because we know where mm-hmm. your creativity kind of goes in the moment. Um, yeah. And we can accommodate for even more future crazy shit. So. Yeah. And even um, just just my last session, uh, again, I'll get into that one because that was insane. But um, the final boss of the, of the the big bad that I finally put in for them to uh, for my players to kill. Um, everyone was fighting and going crazy. And my one player, Laura, decided to come up with um, this crazy idea. She cut off a displacer tentacle, dis- uh, displacer beast tentacle, like five games ago or something like that. And she's just always had it in her inventory. And I think she got, um, I think there was an encounter and there was like a sack of stuff from orcs or goblins or something. And they, she had these, uh, little needles, um, that you could use for like a blow dart. And they did, uh, it had like goblins blood on it or something. And it did like an extra two D 10 damage. Right. So, so everyone's going crazy and fighting. And she's just like, I want to combine my items. I want to take this tentacle displacer beast tentacle and I want to just attach these these needles to it and I want to try to attack them. I was like, well, okay, well, how many do you want to do? And she was like, well, I want to try to do 20 of them or 50 of them or whatever she said. And I was like, all right, so roll. So she rolled kind of low and I was like, all right, I'll allow 10. But since you've never done this before, you know, you need a couple of turns to kind of figure this out. So it took her, I yep. think, like three turns, I think it was, to like shove these needles into the into this displacer beast tentacle. Yeah. It was awesome. This like major battle was happening and <laughs> yeah. Laura's in the background like fucking loading an old time musket. Yeah. Just taking her time. <laughs> like, and, and crafting she's like, this, this is so going to work. This is so going to work. And it, it, like you gave her the rolls, the DC. She even yeah. attacked with disadvantage. There was yeah. like a lot going on and you could finish what happened. <laughs> yeah, so she, and and it was it was a really cool scene because everyone was going crazy. There's people going down and but so was the big bad and it was the final blow. This big cool idea that she had, it was pretty much the final blow. I think he had like two hit points after it, but it was this big mm-hmm. final blow that brought him to his knee and everybody could do their last swing on him before he finally died and it was just a really cool and that's what I like and I appreciated the fact that I gave my player some items and she was creative enough to I want to do this and put this together and now I've made this cool thing out of the items you gave me right. to really enhance this combat more than I could ever even think so the way Mike said I want to be surprised I was pleasantly supply- surprised would I ever would I ever allow that again probably not because that was like a lot it was like 16 <laughs> d10 would I ever allow it again probably not but <laughs> oh my it God. was it was a really cool idea and like i've always said creativity yeah i'm always there for it so yeah i totally agree with that yeah and even if something is completely game breaking like that where it just completely decimates your your big bad um you still have an entire campaign to come up with other big bads so you know as a dm if you've invested a lot of time creating a really cool big bad and your player does some shit like this let them have their moment. Just yeah. let the, mm-hmm. let the, let them shine. Let them kill this big bad. There are plenty of other big bads for your campaign yeah. to come up in the future. Just let them have it, dude. Cause exactly. It's that that like the the endorphins or whatever that kind of fire off in their brain of doing something mm-hmm. really badass is timeless. It yeah. Means- and yeah, and it makes them it makes them want to play, and it makes them want to be more creative and interact. Exactly. So sacrifice sacrifice a big bad. You're the DM. You know who you you can sacrifice. You know which NPC that it's not of really high consequence if they're if they're like murked in two seconds. Like you know, you're the creator of the world. So let them murk someone. Exactly. Like, let them feel that if they if they're not used to rolling d20s and let them get that endorphin rush of a d20 by painting a d20 scene, even if they don't roll a d20, they don't roll a natural twenty. Like let them have a crit scene. Yeah. And they'll have that same feeling. 
especially if they're if they announce to the dm what they are rolling for and if the dm is like Mm -hmm. that's actually kind of fucking cool i'm gonna give you the illusion of rolling for it but i'm automatically gonna make you pass it because i just think that's really and (laughs) so for our viewers and listeners you guys know that i've been um getting into bx D &D, uh which is like pre a D D, pre first edition right it's basic expert edition D D with uh, old school essentials and um we're we're currently playing through the keep on the borderlands and our party interacted with uh the ogre um that is that is in one of the caves at the caves of chaos and one of our players courtney she decided that she, because she's playing an assassin which is an advanced class um that she was gonna sort of hide climb up on a on a wall and assassins have this ability where they basically can kill uh, any creature with one hit as long as Um, they pass their check (laughs) as long as they pass their check so here we have this massive ogre and i had planned for it to be like this really taxing dangerous encounter and she was like i'm just gonna climb up the fucking side of the cliff it was where he doesn't see me and then i'm just gonna like chuck my dagger at, the, at like the spine of his like the back of his neck the nape of his neck i was like all right yeah go for it she rolled she passed the uh the roll for the assassination thing which you do get at level one which is insane um and she she just took out an ogre like <laughs> one shot man. one one <laughs> shot in basic expert D. she killed an ogre with one hit as an assassin yeah um i didn't even get to go yet yeah. <laughs> and and for those of you who don't know, that is insane. That's insane to do. That is insane. Like, old school D&D, you can get murdered. Your whole party can get murdered by a giant rat. Yeah. Very easily, let alone an ogre, you know? Yeah. Um, and no, she shined. She did what she wanted to do. She played her class. She played her character. And she succeeded. And I was like, fuck it. You do the thing, man. I mean, there there was a consequence to it. They actually lost one of their retainers, but because um, the the body wound up falling on him and crushing him. Um, but moments like that, fuck it, just let him do it. Let him do it. It's cool. It fits with their character. It fits with their their personal narrative. Just let him do it. Of course, naturally, I have to fix that so that doesn't happen again in the future. <laughs> but I mean, that's that's always how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You live and you learn, man. Trial and error. But yeah, that that always enhances the encounter having the players get involved and maybe not go off the book completely and maybe do a little bit of homebrew and let them have their creativity. I, I totally agree with that. That's here, here. Do it. Mm-hmm. For sure. All right, cool. So, yeah, the, the next question I got, um, this is something I'm always curious about. Um, I know I always think about this um, when I'm creating a session. Um, so let's get into this one. When and where do you enjoy inserting encounters? So hmm. for this, um, I know it's kind of like a weird question, um, but for me, um, just to get the ball rolling, I, I enjoy encounters are an interesting thing. I know that there are D and D campaigns out there or um, groups of of players that enjoy sitting down. And just doing encounters, right? Mm-hmm. Like you know, you have like I think uh, what what does uh, wizards make? They make that that encounters uh, box where it's just specifically designed to like fight a bunch of stuff, fight a big bad, and then you're done. There's like maybe a small story, um, but for me, I enjoy putting encounters in where it makes sense in the story. Um, so if, uh, for instance, um, when I was introducing my big bad um, into my world. Um, while they were walking to, to a destination, my players, um, out of nowhere, I would have bandits attack or, um, you know, just like wildlings out in the wild and, uh, you know, they would fight them and kill them. But as much as like a, of a boring encounter that was, they just killed a bunch of bandits. They ended up looting and finding a note from the big bad to the bandits saying, you need to meet here. They're going to be here at this time. You need to hide out here and ambush them and kill them and this and that. So it was like it, it, it. I inserted them specifically to enhance the big bad. Oh, he's trying to kill us. He's trying to go crazy. He's 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 really trying to do anything he can to get at us. 
And I feel like, you know, instead of just, like, inserting a, 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 an encounter because, like, oh, it's a good time, you know, or, or no, like, have encounters matter. So yeah. put, it, put it in a spot where this makes sense. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mike, why don't you, why don't you uh, follow up with that? Uh, so a prime example, I find that there's, you know, there's encounters that you purposely want to put in, and then there's, you know, the encounters that just happen. So you can't really control those. They just happen. You know, players are, you know, chaos wearing pants, so it just happens. True. But um, I try to insert encounters based on the actions of my players. Like, I know what my big bads and what's going on in my world. But the players aren't going to, aren't going to always be in the right place to encounter, like, that scene. Like, if they're not there, they're not there, even though it still happened. Yeah. So I try to bring... If they're not there for those story elements, I try to bring at least some story elements to them. A prime example is a character of mine. I've mentioned this NPC before, the Grinning Rot. Ah, yes. Yes. He's obsessed with a character in the group. And at spur of the moment, she decided that it was her birthday. And it was actually Laura again. Luckily, there was no displacer... uh, tentacles or (laughs) darts but she just decided it was her birthday that day so the group threw her a birthday party so they were all having fun and i was like this would be a good time to put another grinning rot encounter he Mm. would come to her birthday he's obsessed with her so he showed up and he started like dancing with her like like you know amongst the crowd and no one was able to see and she wasn't sure if he was really there or she was imagining it and he gave her the gift of seeing her first birthday when she was born, except because he was there, except her mother died at birth because it was a whole ritual and stuff. So she, I was able to give her a bit of a lore dump about her mother and how she was born and why she's important, but also creep the group out because she wasn't there anymore at the party when he was showing her this. There was just like um dirt from a grave on the ground where she was dancing with the grinning rod and they didn't know where she was so he literally took her so a whole encounter sprang from that that made the group realize that he could manipulate them and they can't stop him and made her realize why she's cursed in a way so all that stemmed on spur of the moment that she wanted to throw a birthday party that's so, so cool. So that was my gift. That was my gift to her <laughs> as a player. You get to watch your mom die, but there you go. I love that. What a creative idea. So <laughs> That's super creative. Yeah. Yeah. So it just, I, I am kind of like a inspiration vampire. Like I really get inspired by my players. No matter what they do, I get inspired by it. And it changes my world as my world changes them. And then, Everything it just circles back on itself and a story. My my goal is the end story. So, like I try to put encounters that keep the story going and doesn't and definitely don't feel like a a doorstop in the story. I don't want to be like oh here you know here is just random owl there. Like I don't really like doing random encounters in yeah. in the wild. Um, usually, if there's something on watch, if someone sees something on watch or something seems random, it's I'm trying to develop their character. So it's something that only they would notice, or something that I want to see how them as players would react to, so I can dictate the rest of the story and tailor it towards them. That's like, there's cool. always a reason for my encounters. That's cool. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, that that's the marking of a good DM. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> oh, stop. <laughs> Well, you know, it, you know, we talk about how like, you know, it, players getting creative, you know, they, you know, they feed off of your stuff, but we do we do the same exact thing. We feed off of your creativity mm-hmm. too. And it just it just builds to this just really cool idea that not only has the DM created, but the players have also created as well. Mm-hmm. That gets everybody involved. That's cool. And like and that. that's why I the one thing players do that I actually don't like 
It's just literally one thing, and it's very a personal thing. I don't like when they ask, would that have happened if I didn't do this? And I always tell them, I'm not answering that because that's what the screen is for. Don't right. like, don't look behind the curtain. Just enjoy the story. Don't ask if I came up with that first or this, this, this. This is too good to be true. Blah, blah, blah. Just enjoy the experience of the story. You don't need yeah. to know, you know, how stuff is made back here. Don't come back here. Just don't come back here. Yeah, Just yeah, enjoy yeah. Enjoy the stuff out there. <laughs> That's good. Very cool. What about you, Stavi? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm a little bit of both between you guys. I'm kind of stretched in between, but I mean, I with with my encounters just in general, um I have I have two mindsets, right? I have one mindset which is the travel encounters, which includes combat and non-combat like RP encounters as well as just non-combat stuff like discovering uh landmarks or discovering you know like a destroyed wagon on the side of the road with like fresh bodies you know investigative stuff um which could lead to combat but not necessarily so i have i have that stuff um and then i have like i don't want to say dungeon encounters but but pretty much anywhere that um monsters or other adventurers or you know whatever could exist that more or less are i guess inside um mm -hmm. the reason why i make that distinction i mean this is like towns it is dungeons it's ruins it's cathedrals it's wizard towers out in the wilderness it's caverns it's you know whatever um it, it, specific locations as opposed to wilderness um and i make those distinctions because um I just like what Mike did with um or no just like uh Dan what you said with with the bandits and they had like a letter which is very elder scrolls by the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that's that's very very elder scrolls where you kill somebody and it's like, you know, this person is wanted by by this guild. Kill them. Exactly. Yeah. Um <laughs> you know, um when when it comes when it comes to that sort of stuff, I also like to trickle in uh some story um like periphery kind of lore uh whether it is um like a like a decree to kill this party or to capture them alive for some evil purpose or what have you you know whatever maybe they're sniffing too deeply into somebody else's affairs and they're pissing off the big bad because the big bad is aware that they're kind of getting a little too close to the fire um yeah. so they try to you know cut that off before they get any deeper into what you know the the overall plot is or the goal of the big bad um but i also like random encounters even if it doesn't add anything to the plot necessarily i personally coming from a again bx uh background primarily now um i like to create a sense of urgency when people are traveling around when the party's traveling around i don't want them to ever feel like they're wholly safe in the wilderness I want them to feel like, oh my god, we were camping and we were just attacked by, um, shit, I don't know, um, a, a pack of dire wolves or something in in the foothills, um, and we had to flee our campsite because they were chasing us down or, or something like that. We should really put in the effort to get to the next town and stop screwing around out here because it's clearly dangerous, um. Which is great because that could also help as a DM to to push the narrative even further. If they're faffing around too much out in the wilderness, having fun, let them do that for a little bit. But if they start making that the campaign, you have to keep, kind of push them in a direction by by giving them a sense mm -hmm. of urgency. Um, whether that's by a random encounter that could very easily kill them um, or an easy encounter that drops a piece of lore that will convince them to continue on. Um, but again... Combat encounters, RP counters, non-combat encounters that aren't necessarily RP, um, are they're all paramount to to creating a very dynamic experience for your players, I feel. Um so I don't know. I, I kind of I jump around. It's really situational. It, it it really is. Um it depends on how your world is set up. Mine specifically is a very high fantasy world with some darker fantasy elements in it based on like what kind of monsters exist. 
Um, but I mean, there are unicorns, there are manticores, there are centaurs and elves and halflings, and it's very Tolkien-ish. Um, there are Ents, there are ogres, you know, they're everything that you would expect from a D&D campaign. Um, but like, generally speaking, towns and villages don't really travel out into the wilds because they know that out there it's untamed land. And these creatures have been there since the creation of whatever planet this, this campaign takes place on. Um, and, and they're only like these very specific pockets of civilization and you have to travel between them. And that's where the danger comes in. Right. Um, you know, if you've ever played World of Warcraft, you know, if you stick to the roads, for the most part, you're safe. The second you go off the roads, though, you, you know, you might get ganged up on by like 30 murlocs at level one. And you're yeah. like, oh, no, dude. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, like, <laughs> I, I, tr- I try to take that same um, design uh, and and apply it to my, my tabletop. You can go out into the wilderness, you can explore, you're going to find a lot of dangerous stuff that are probably going to out-level you by a lot. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. What, what's really good about um, the way you do encounters, uh, Stavi, is that even though you do do random encounters, and I'm not a huge random encounter uh, per, uh, DM, but at least your random encounters make sense. Uh, it's it's what would be found in that terrain and that yeah. area during that month, during that you put in the, the farmer's monstrous manual almanac work in to <laughs> find out what would be here on this month in this weather time of year with this terrain. So it's not, you, you could fight it's random, but you know what to expect in the area. It's not just going to be like, you know, you're in, like, a Sherwood forest, and you get attacked by piranhas. That doesn't make any fucking sense! Right, How did you get yeah. attacked by piranhas? What did you roll on? Right. Where did, where did they come from? <laughs> yeah, no, and that, that's a good point, too, and I, I, that, that, that is something worth mentioning, and I, I truly implore DMs to do this, especially if you're starting out. Um, when you're when you're designing where your players are going to be adventuring for the most part, figure out what that terrain and that biome looks like. If it's a lot of woods, it's a, if it's like foothills, like um, grasslands or mountainous regions, um, look through the monster manual and and like just kind of scroll through it. You know, it doesn't matter really the challenge rating because no encounter should be balanced for the players every single time. Mm-hmm. Um, but like find creatures that would exist in this environment naturally and put it on like a random generation list. Um, and mm-hmm. as players are traveling through it, roll for a random encounter. If one pops up, roll on that list for the creatures that exist in that biome. That's exactly what, what Mike said. That's, that's what I do. And I have for day and night also, because there are nocturnal creatures that you will not see in the daytime in the middle of the woods that you will see at night. So, yeah, that's, a. Uh, I- going off of that like i i don't really do um random encounters either or random combat either um but i do i do the same exact thing where i look into the setting um my players had to go up north to a, a dwarven land up in up in the north it was very wintry it was very snowy so that's ex- that's actually exactly what i did um is i went through the monster manual and i looked up like snowy or ice type creatures and sure. that's how I, I i put some polar bears in um i put like ice miffits in um their big bad for that session was an ice troll cool. so it, put putting putting those kinds of creatures in that you encounter that kind of brings the setting in a bit more like okay yeah we are in this like snowy environment or something like that you know so i i agree with that like picking picking the monsters for that specific setting just enhances their involvement because it's it, it's like that it's like that in myth and legends and like my personal favorite like fairy tales and fables they would say don't go in those caves there's tommy knockers in there don't go over there there's red caps there and that's their territory we know that's their territory they like those kind of trees don't go there yeah mm-hmm. so it would be like that in the game like don't go to this um glacier area in the north because there's polar bear owl bears there that's where they hunt uh you know seal lions or something don't go there exactly exactly and just one last point i want to make too like what i mentioned before about um going through the monster manual and picking out creatures that may not like their challenge rating for fifth edition specifically 
um, may not match the the player's power level, that's perfectly fine. Um, because yeah, if they're I, if they are, I never, I never match anybody's. No, 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 no. Like if if you go through the marshes or the bogs and you find like a black dragon, yeah, you're running. Um, yeah. If you go into the frosty north and you run into a frost giant living in the caves, you know, like you're not gonna want to fight that, but you can now use that as a plot point um for for a campaign to make like a really cool side um mission or to tie it into your main campaign or something like that random and gen- randomly generated stuff can add a lot yeah uh, but you just you have to be careful with it and i can i can see the appeal of not wanting to do random encounters um you could you could really ruin your entire campaign if <laughs> if you're not careful <laughs> it could be crazy <laughs> it, it really can be super chaotic yeah but but I also I you know I like it too, um, keeping it random because it keeps you on your toes as a DM as well. Like mm-hmm. you don't even know what you're getting yourself into, so right. you kind of have to become creative yourself and figure out okay, so how do I want to how do I want to play this out? Um, you know, what's the environment like? Can they can they use certain things in the environment now all of a sudden? And so I I think a ra- I think a random encounter is a great idea too. Yeah, when I do them though, I because we're doing old school D and D. They have in the table of contents or the monster manual, if you will, um, when 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 you uh, wander into or when you run into wandering monsters, they have uh, at the top of it a number of encountered monsters. And it could be anywhere for certain creatures, like one usually by itself, like a beholder or something, because there's not like a pack of beholders, ro- you know, rolling together. But goblins and orcs who move around at night because they can't stand in the sun, you may run into a goblin or orc warband that may have 60 or 120 goblins, like an yeah. actual yeah. full military force marching through, you know, the, the woods or the foothills and something like that. Clearly, your players aren't going to want to fight that. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember that from I remember that from second edition too. They had that in the second edition in Monsters Manual. Yeah, and I, I wish that fifth edition players would would utilize that and DMs would utilize that a little bit more of just like insurmountable odds. Hey, that's where making your own charts come in. Yeah, you exactly. Can do that yourself. So Yeah. Right. All right, cool. Yeah. Yeah. We know so much about combat and enc- and encounters. It's insane. So I have I have one final question. It's not really a question. Um, more of just like, hey, let's tell a story. Um, how do you make your encounters interesting? Um, sometimes, you know, combat can be a little dull or sometimes it can drag. So do you guys maybe have a story of, uh, how you turned a uh, combat or you created a combat into something that was just insane or, uh, really out there, like not by the book at all. Do you have any fun stories like that? I think I, I think Mike definitely does. I think Mike definitely. Does. I mean, <laughs> he, you you already just talked about the big birthday spoil, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, in in the same campaign, I had an encounter. Basically, the group made their own encounter. Did something very showy. They with magic and this. They sought revenge for one of the other one of the NPCs. And attack this um, this guild outside of this town. Now, after they did that, I told them, that's fine, but there's going to be consequences. You were literally just a mile outside of a major city. And for two or three games after that, I would do little cinema scenes showing what the city was doing. And they basically got this character called the Dawn Inquisitor. And he was investigating what happened on the roads to the town. And he had this magical item called, uh, I think it was like an eldritch uh, oculus. And it was able to uh, read the magic circles in the area that dictate to tell him what spells were cast, where the spells were cast from. If there was a teleportation uh, spell, what direction did it send? the caster so as the game progressed i did little vignettes of him getting closer to where they were then Mm -hmm. one game started and he had a small um i don't say platoon but a small group of his men and he basically 
occupied the town they were in, because that's where the spells ended, and he was trying to investigate and find out who did that stuff. Hmm. So the encounter was, they found, an, uh, one of the players found that uh, she had a father, a long lost father in the town, and they didn't really like him, so they just flippantly said to the Dawn Inquisitor who was investigating them, oh, investigate him, I think he's magical. But they didn't realize what the Dawn Inquisitor was, so he went to investigate the father, and then they were there, going like, I wonder what he's doing. He was in the room for a while, came out, had blood on his hands. I had him come out of the room, sigh to himself for what he had to do, then come downstairs, order a bowl of water, clean his hands, and leave. And they were like, what just happened? What did we do? Why did that happen? And I was like, you, as a joke, sent this guy to that guy. So they went in and the father was beaten into like an inch of his life while he was being interrogated. Oh my God. And <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> they were, cause they were so terrified of the Dawn Inquisitor finding them, but they didn't realize that their actions sent him to someone else. So then, oh, man. And, the Dawn Inquisitor, at a certain point, he was only able to stay in that city for three weeks. Because it's a it's a neutral, aligned city, and it can only be occupied by the reigning kingdom for three weeks, then it has to leave. So, he had three weeks to find who did this assault outside of the city. And they really were just terrified of this man. Wow. And they were so scared... I think I told you about this then. They were so scared, they actually called out to the Grinning Rot to protect them. Right, right. The person that's been plaguing them. And then that got out of hand, and the Don Inquisitor wound up saving them from the thing that came from the Grinning Rot. And it was just like an encounter that they just didn't know who to trust, who to believe. There was more consequences or repercussions that came out of that. And all of that just basically stemmed from them making the encounter outside of the town and that just rippled out into multiple other encounters that is insane that's I, really cool i really love that whole butterfly effect yeah just one one small move turned into a huge issue for them to overcome that's mm -hmm. really and cool they're still they're still feeling it because another another member of the group um his dealings kind of got the better of him and he was taken to the astral verge uh it's basically the astral plane in my game but it's a uh, a place where like it's the stars above as below and each star is the conscious thought of every living creature and in between the stars there's these entities called the maw and they're creatures that devour sanity and they devour intellect so they devour the stars of our mind so he was a warlock and that was his patron and he betrayed him. So he was basically being devoured by him and the group decided to just abandon him to the astral verge. It wasn't worth getting him. So one of the NPCs was like, but well, we have to save him. But everyone said no. So she thought, cause she was a fairy and she was innocent. She thought it was okay to call out to the grinning rot cause she saw the other player do it. Oh. So she wound up calling out to the grinning rot and when they came, the Grinning Rot was there, and the Grinning Rot made some kind of deal with her. And she's, like, naive and childlike, and she won't tell them what she gave up. And oh, that's man. a repercussion that they're still feeling. Because they don't know what she gave up in return. Because he always wants something in return, and his goal is to rot. So yeah. they don't know what he did to her. So, like, it just, so shit. everything just stemmed from their actions. It's all it's all connected. That's cool, man. <laughs> That's super cool. You tell stories so well. The, I swear, the, you really do, <laughs> man. Like the the amount of mental gymnastics that you'd have to go to to just come up with that on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. And hey, for all of our listeners, you're going to be here too. You'll be at Mike's level for sure if you continue playing your yeah. tabletop exactly. RPGs. Oh yeah, baby. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, everything just falls into place, and eventually you'll be like, that's awesome, and then it'll just get more awesome. Exactly, exactly. Hmm. What about you, Stavi? You got a fun, you got a fun, uh, you got a fun story? Well, so, as you know, 
I've only just started playing D and D again after, Oh my God, so many years of like a hiatus, right? Yeah. Like back when I was still living in the old state in the old country, yeah. um, <laughs> uh, my homeland, the homeland. It was, it's, it's been a long, long time since I played D and D. Um, with the exception of this campaign that we've started now. And again, it's, I went back to like the roots, basic expert D and D. Um, so I have been creating a world and I have been going really hard on the creation side of, of this world building, mostly because I've been reading the Silmarillion and a, a bunch of like Tolkien's like lore, uh, pieces like the appendices and stuff like that. And like, and I'm, I'm seeing how the master, the grand master of fantasy created his world. And I'm taking bits and pieces from that. And I'm, I'm injecting, um, heartache and tragedy and, and, and happiness, but like happiness at a major cost. And, y- you know, like all these different themes that he used and wove, w- weaved into his, uh, storytelling amazingly like there are there is literally nobody better than Tolkien I don't care I will die on that hill um but so because we only just started playing we haven't really gotten into any of my homebrew stuff uh we started doing the homebrew things in the in the beginning if you remember with the first dungeon that you guys just that's how the game started you traveled and you were at the dungeon here we go um and then I realized that it was probably a little too dangerous for you guys to throw you into that right away so, you know, we kind of, I, I made the executive decision to back off and then start working on uh, one of the pre, um, pre-printed pre modules to, to keep on the Borderlands. However, there are, there are encounters that I have created that I would like to use um, that I, I don't know if I should talk about them right now because like I'm actually kind of proud of how they turned out, like the story and like what the players discover and all of this other stuff. That that's the worst when you want to share it, but you don't want to spoil anything. So yeah, to, like you just have to chew it back and just wait. I know, and it kind of sucks because you guys are my players. You know, like I yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing a podcast with my players uh, for my campaign, so you know what I will I will divulge. I will divulge just this, this one thing. And it's, it, let me pull out my massive binder of old school D&D lore here. Um, because I, I will talk about this one thing that I have created. Oh boy. Okay. Oh boy. So, <laughs> Jesus. These are my, these are like my campaign notes. I know you guys can't see it on, on, or you can't listen to it, but it's, um, or who are listening, you can't see it. Um, but basically I have close to eight or nine pages top to bottom of like notebook of, uh, how I want the campaign to go. And you may, and it, and it's sectioned off by levels. So like if the players are one to three, this is what they experience once they level up the next section of the campaign will unlock for them and there will be some kind of catalyst that brings them to the next part. Yeah, Um, yeah, yeah. But the one encounter that I've created, um, there is... This is kind of spoily, but I'm going to tell you guys anyway because you are in in my party. Um, I'll I'll, I'll just memory wipe. Don't worry. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So here... I have created a a adult green dragon who is eight thousand years old by the name of Cassiflex. Um, he is covered in battle scars from centuries of fending off assaults by uh, by humans and demi humans, you know, men, elves, dwarves, that sort of thing. Uh, he's missing his tail. Um, much like all dragons, he covets treasure and elven foods. Uh, he has a lair somewhere and hidden in a forest. Um, he, so here's the thing. He's very egotistical and he likes elvish food. He, he, that's one of the first things, like when the players will encounter him, they will realize that he is intelligent and he will speak to them. He's very old. You know, he's kind of cranky. He will kill you if he feels like it, but he does like to have conversations with people. Um, and if the players decide to not kill him outright or try to, you know, provoke an attack on him outright, 
they will discover that, you know, this yawning kind of aloof, kind of like, I have no time for you dragon, um, will ask the players of something to do something for them. Um, ultimately, I'm just going to TLDR it because I don't want to get down to the nitty gritty, but effectively what wound up happening was thousands of years ago, there was this elven, uh, elvish woman, um, who, uh, encountered this dragon, you know, the typical princess in the tower and dragon kind of protecting her kind of thing. But the, the ro- yeah, but the roles are reversed. The princess was protecting the dragon ah. instead of the other way around. Um, but not protecting him physically, but protecting him so he could just rest and sleep and be alone and be isolated and keep to himself. He's not violent by nature, but he has grown to become more intolerant of people because people are like, oh shit, there's a dragon. We heard rumors of a dragon. He's got to have treasure. Let's go and fuck with him. And he's like, no, dude, I'm just, I'm just trying to sleep, man. I'm just, I'm just trying to kick it back. I'm just trying to kick it. I'm trying to trying to put on my wheel of fortune at 8 p.m. Right, man. Antiques <laughs> Roadshow comes on. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> dude. So, um, so what what wound up happening was, um, at, at some point, there was there was a really significant um force of action against the dragon uh, by uh some local lord who has long long since been dead thousands of years ago. And um, this is where the elf woman actually winds up finding the dragon hurt and almost at the brink of death. Um, and she heals him and she stays with this dragon and and she would she'll still stay with him. She'll leave. She'll um, bring him uh, elven food, which is how he gained the taste for elvish food, um, which is why he likes it. And uh, so you find out from talking to the dragon with the missing tail and the battle scars that the elvish woman had stopped coming around. Uh, he divulges this information. Um, and so it kicks off like the side quest where you're trying to find the whereabouts of this elvish woman for this dragon at the promise of actual treasure that he is guarding. Um, so he's like, all the treasure in the world, you know, means nothing to me so long as I can see her name i'm not going to say her name because she is a prominent character um but uh and i and i wish to see her again she has not been here um yeah so you go through this whole thing you find out what happened to her uh it's pretty cool i don't want to get into it but it yeah so you you eventually get back to him um and then you find out that uh his tail um, was cut off and it was it was used to craft um, the crown of a local lord that they use for ceremonies for crowning new new kings and, and lords and stuff like that. Um, yeah, it's kind of hard to talk about it without spoiling too much. I mean, this is already nah, too it. spoilery. But yeah, no, nah, it's all right. <laughs> yeah, no, I, like there, there's there's like a lot of like emotional ties and there's there's a lot of political ties because you can choose to help this dragon and to help this elvish woman um but doing so would require you to actively overstep a boundary with another major force in the region um yeah picking and choosing it's picking and choosing it's sort of like that mass effect you know paragon renegade kind of thing um but but it's not so clearly defined because you find out something about the, the, the elvish woman and this dragon. Um, that's, that's, uh, it's, it, it, it can upset the entire balance of the region. I'll just, I'll just say it that way. So that's cool. I, I don't have really like a, like a direct elaborate story to tell you like how awesome Mike's was. I, it's something that I'm planning. And once we finally get to it and we talk about it on the podcast, I'll, I'll reveal it uh, yeah. for the listeners. But it's um, it's something that is heavily Tolkien inspired, number one. Um, so, there, again, heartbreak, happiness, tragedy, um, turmoil, political turmoil, um, power plays by by major figures in the region. Um, yeah, it's all it's all very like shifting sort of like dynamic complex situation that i don't want to spoil <laughs> no it's cool the, the, so. the fact the fact that you like backed this one single encounter with so much lore i mean that's that's insane 
I I I I love that you because it's something I don't do. I kind of just go like in, like from session to session and kind of create my story as I go. But you you and I th- I think Mike as well. You, you guys you guys are really you guys really get into the lore of your world and like what's happening not only what the players are doing but like the entire world. And, right. And that is just like that is so that's so interesting really and- getting into that. May I point out that, like, finding this dragon in itself is a random encounter. Yeah, right. So it's not like, you know, somebody says, hey, there's a dragon over there. Go go investigate. No, like, first off, you have to be in the right place. You have to be there at the right time. Um, and you have to have the right roles, or at least I do. And yeah, it's a right. very small percentile chance that you'll encounter the dragon face to face. You may see it flying around far off in the distance going in between clouds and you know, kind of scurrying behind mountain ranges and stuff like that way out in the distance. But to actually find it at home and it doesn't want to kill you at that particular moment, because I also have an encounter where you meet him in person and he kills you outright. Um, <laughs> so, like, there are there are a lot of variables for this particular encounter that will unlock this narrative, that will shift and change the entire paradigm of my game world for that region, depending on depending on what the players do and who they side with. So, that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. That's awesome. But sorry for the rambling. That's just kind of where... No, where, no, no. I mean, know. I I totally yeah. get it. We're, we're DMs. I, this is what we do. This I, is what we do. I, I just get really excited when I create stories. <laughs> 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 and, and, and it I sucks because... That. Dan, you remember, right? Remember when we used to play 5th um, uh, Edition way back in the day? And uh, this was this was uh, before I had a car, so I think you would drive me home. Yeah. And every single time when I was in the car with you, I'd be like, "Do you want to know what I have planned?" Like I had yeah. to tell somebody. <laughs> and we, every- it would be like a fifteen minute drive, but then we would sit outside your house for like thirty more minutes and just discuss everything. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know. I get I get really enthusiastic, and I just want to share pe- with people my ideas. It just sucks that the people that I'm sharing with are the people who are playing and, and yeah, and, well, so. I mean, you know, <laughs> but that's like, as like, you know, D and D players, we, we get it, you know, like right. not a lot of other people will get it. We'll get it. We'll understand. Be like, Oh, that is cool. Or like, maybe we'll give it like an extra suggestion or something. Cause like, we're just as passionate as you are. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so I totally get that. But yeah, that that's, that's, that's all I have. Right. I mean, there are plenty of other shit that I have planned. Yeah, believe, believe me, that list of of four or five full pages, front and back, of like the tiered level um, progression for the campaign. Like, there is some stuff in there that it's heavy. Like, yeah, yeah, it, it's heavy. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I got for that. Yeah. So, great question. And yeah, I, I, uh, I'll go ahead. I was gonna say, what do you have? Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you, <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> you guys. I mean, I, I don't even compare. Again, um, especially for new listeners, I'm a new DM. Been only DMing for a year, and like the uh, you know, you guys have been really planning it out. And I I just kind of go as I go. I'm making the story. It's coming along pretty well. Um, but this was so. I'll I'll, I'll talk about last session. So last session was um basically the end of season one of of my entire story um it was finally time for my players to fight my very first big bad and um the whole lead up to this was my players were um they were trying to figure out uh what was going on with this guy danik who keeps trying to kill them and this like i was talking with the bandits with the note and um, it turned out that Danik was not only trying to attack them, but also the city they lived in. So the king of the city was like, all right, we have to go gain um, essentially uh, allies. We have to go gain allies. So over the course of a couple of sessions, they were gaining allies um, from different cities and different towns and all that. And they finally got enough people and then it hit. He came in, he stormed in, he killed a bunch of people, and he's like, that's it. It's time for war. We're going to war. So last session was the war. And for a while, I was trying to figure out exactly how I wanted to do this because I have personally have never seen how wars or big, big battles work in D&D. Right. So 
for weeks, I was going through, um, I was asking questions on Reddit. I was asking questions on like D and D Facebook pages about like people's ideas. Um, and there, there's stuff in like supplemental books. There's stuff in homebrew, homebrew book, uh, homebrew books. That was hard to say. Um, <laughs> that sounds hard to say. That was really hard to say, <laughs> but, um, it all came down to I'm this. I'm not even going to risk it. Yeah, I no, no, that was too much. But it all came down to this one comment I got on Reddit um, where he was like, um, he said something about, you know, you have this big battle, but remember, you have players. So do this big battle, but keep your players your focus. So I was mm. like, okay. And he was like, and just make the battle general. Like, if they want to get involved, get involved. If they don't want to get involved, they don't have to. So I was like, okay, so that helps it. So, and also Mike gave me this cool uh, chart because um, I, I kind of spoil it a little bit because I, I always say like Mike is like my my personal side DM. If I ever have questions, I, I hit him up and like, hey, do you have any like cool ideas for this or something? And um, he gave me this cool morale chart. So I, I, I went in it and I was like, okay, so here's what's going to happen. Um, both sides of the battlefield are going to be even numbers. There's going to be a set amount of minis on my board numbered one through 15. These minis are going to go to battle. While that's happening, the players have multiple choices they want to do. They can go chop down trees to kind of block the enemy army. They can roll over rocks. They can push carts. They can attack. They can use their spells to kind of ground them or kill them. They have multiple things, but these, these, these armies are going to fight. And what I did... Instead of just like, oh, this is happening, I uh, and, and just letting it happen, I actually gave the players three minis each. And I said, you guys are going to have a turn, and then the army's going to have a turn. So they did their own thing, and their ultimate, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, their ultimate goal was to get to the other side of the battlefield where the big bad was, to go kill the big bad. That was their ultimate goal. But they had to get there first. They had to get through this army. So I was like, all right, you guys take your turns, do what you want, and then the army's going to go. But you're all going to have three units, and you're going to fight them, the, the, the enemy army. So while, this was, while they were trying to figure out what to do and get to the big bad, they were also involved in the massive battle combat. They were making the rolls. The enemy was making the rolls. Um, if the enemy messed up, I had that morale chart. They lost morale, so maybe they they took like a negative two on their next roll. So while they were playing their players, they were also playing the war. That's awesome. And it worked out pretty well, I would say. I think it worked out pretty good. Um, oh, it worked out great. I think it worked out pretty well. And, and, and I, I, again, I wanted to keep the players centered and focused. They ended up just like not doing any of like the side stuff to kind of stop the enemies. They were just like killing them all. So thankfully, uh, Danik, the big bad, also had a dragon. So he came in <laughs> and started messing with everybody else. And so it all worked out. Where and the, then I the messed with the dragon. And then you messed with the dragon. And that worked out, too, because he actually grounded the dragon and the whole army started going after the dragon. So the king of their city was like, hey, now's your chance. Go fight the big bad. And they all ran into like his little like mini like modular castle that he made on the other side of the battlefield. And they went in and killed him. And it was a it was a really cool scene with like them on top of the tower fighting the big bad while the dragon's getting beat up by the army. It was just it ended up working out really well. No, it was really cool too because each each of the levels up to the top of this guy's, by the way, moving castle that he was in, being dragged by God knows many horses with giant yeah. wheels on the side. It was on wheels, yeah. Each each level was made by the big bad to mock us individually. That's awesome. And and I Dan kept laughing because my character was having none of it. And yeah. like, my level that was to mock me, I was like, no. And I just went up the stairs. I didn't even engage. I just went up the stairs. <laughs> yeah. Like, like all of the things that happened to my players was because of Danik. So he knew their their tweaks. They knew, like, he, he knew what would get under their skin. So, like, the first room was, uh, like, a bunch of kobolds. Uh, Mike tried to befriend a uh, kobold called Kevin, which Danik ended up killing. So when they first walked into the room... There was five kobolds, and on each of their chests said K-E-V-I-N. Oh, no. And they were like, hey, we're Kevin. And they had to roll a constitution check 
to see if that would affect them mentally. Right. And each player had something similar to that. Where it was like, oh my god, that that was a, like a tragic moment in my personal story. Roll constitution, see if you uh, if you're affected by that. And it all it all just worked out really well. I was really proud of that. That's so that was badass. Like, that was the craziest thing I've ever like created and like made an encounter interesting or fun or like involved. You know what I mean? Dude, that's so that's sick. Honestly, it worked out. It like, worked out really well. Also, don't forget for anybody who's listening, Dungeons and Dragons um, was born out of a tabletop war game uh called chainmail back in the day which is like bolt action you know warhammer you know if you've ever played warhammer or any any sort of like tabletop role-playing game where you have to like measure your movements and do all that stuff with the, the measuring tape that's how D was born so to kind of go back and bring the war gaming-esque elements into D D again is kind of badass that 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 actually kind of reminds me of uh total war warhammer where like you have your hero characters which are the players and then you have like with their special abilities and being able to do things and then you have just like all these grunts running through and yeah you know causing causing a ruckus which reminds me is it cool to uh promote anything on the on the podcast yeah if you'd like so um i'll probably put a picture up uh on this uh here give me one second to pull it out go for it okay so the um the 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 supplement that i wanted to shout out there's a creator an independent creator called nick wright um he uh creates these war gaming um rule set called irregular wars but there's one in particular called fantasy battles and uh, basically, it's a really quick, like fast play mass battle wargaming system that works for a fantasy setting. Um, and it's really cool. And it has the heroes of different classes. Like there are mages or fighters. There are healers and all this other stuff. But there's, you, it's modular and universal enough to where you could literally just create your own units and give them like bonuses. Um depending on what they are so like if you have dwarves you can increase you can make them stout hearted uh which which give them higher defense um but it's a really quick rapid way of playing a war game and i'm actually thinking about incorporating this particular rule set into my D D, kind of like how you did with with your battle yeah um, so i just wanted to shout out nick Wright because i've actually spoken to him personally like on their facebook page and stuff uh like in the comments and everything and he's really cool he's very passionate about this project that's and, cool and like i just want more people to know about it so again that's uh irregular wars fantastic battles uh the cover art is really dope here's a picture of it right here it's just a bunch of uh wolf rider goblins kind of like fighting all these dwarves outside of a dwarven stronghold it's, it's hell yeah it's so fucking cool man that's cool <laughs> as you do as you do as, as you of do. course as one does with like lightning shooting down in the background so yeah um but yeah i just wanted to shout that out real quick because yeah, you know it, it's it, i know it's not D themed but it is fantasy it is. And, it's and, fantasy. And, and it ties into what what you did which is very unique not a lot of people do that yeah i didn't even know how it would work out but it ended up working out pretty good no it worked out great and you and the as someone with ocd i appreciated the color coordination oh yeah of, yeah i had like sticky notes we each had numbers. a color and then <laughs> that it it related to the minis that were part of the army like i appreciated that yeah <laughs> i was like who's blue who's green all right your turn your turn yeah it worked out it, no, it was just very it was a very very well done way to do that mm -hmm. thank you very much i appreciate that <laughs> I, I wish i could have joined you guys one day. One day. When you come back to the motherland. <laughs> the, the motherland, yeah. One day. <laughs> yes, when you come back to the motherland, we'll roleplay for two days straight. Yes! Just straight up. Dude. We won't stop. I will go there in <laughs> wizard robes. <laughs> like, actually, and a hat. I've actually done that before. Not the wizard robes, but... Like, I've ran from, like, 11 to, like, 1 in the morning. People napped a bit, and then I started again at, like, eight nine in the morning for whoever woke up and then i did yeah. it for the rest of the day oh my god stavi do you remember our first session we oh, literally you mean, like, did like we played for like 12 hours we played for 12 hours then we went home and came back the next day and just played for another 12 hours yeah i remember that <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> so all right so yeah that that i would say that was pretty good 
That, that was that was a really yeah. good. But before <laughs> before we end, um, just real quick, rapid fire. Um, I want to get back to um our buddy Eric that uh sent us a question uh that came in a little late for uh, the last podcast, the uh, the Q and A. Thanks um, for the question. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yeah, Eric. Um, his question was, uh, where can I get inspiration and creativity without the awkward pauses of me trying to think in the middle of a game? Well, I could actually answer this right away. Go for Go it. Go for it. Yeah. So this is going to be a weird thing to equate to. Um, but if you've ever met anybody who does um, freestyling, like freestyle rapping, what they wind up doing uh, more often than not, because I do know a few people who are actually really, really good at just top of their head spitting stuff, um, is that they they will have like a notebook, <laughs> more or less. Like they'll just think of like a quick rhyme and they'll be like, oh, that sounds cool. And then they'll write it down. Oh, that sounds cool. Even if it doesn't rhyme with what they wrote before, they'll just think of like cool, like funny one liners. And then over time, when they have this massive uh, notebook of stuff, eventually they'll start noticing patterns of things rhyming with other things. Um, and, you know, of course, with a lot of practice and, and wordsmithing and stuff like that, like they, they could just come up with like the craziest freestyles. It's sort of the same thing for D&D. Because as a DM, more often than not, you are freestyling. Um, so, um, I mean, obviously practice, right? But inspirations? Start looking into other work, I would say, um, that is already well-established and and is um, impactful. Like, if you read or hear something and, and you get shivers or like you're you feel something in your heart like butterflies you know not not because it's cute or anything but you're like whoa that touched me on a level that i didn't expect um which is what happened to me when i started reading again the silmarillion and mm -hmm. and and finding out about the trees of valinor and baron and luthien and stuff like that i was like whoa this is tragic i was like yeah. this is awesome um Hint, hint, that's actually kind of the inspiration for the dragon encounter that I mentioned earlier. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I only, I just made that up as I was writing it. Like when I was, when I was writing the, the list of random encounters, I was like, we have to have a dragon. It's not dr Dungeons and Dragons without a dragon. And since I was doing a forest at the time, I know that forest dragons or forest is green dragons. Um, so I was like, okay, well, what, what can I do with this dragon that makes it unique? Like, do I want my players to just encounter it and then that's it? Like, do I want them to just kill it and take the loot and that's it? No, the, it has to be significant. So, and this could just be a me thing, truly. I don't know how many people, like how, how often this happens with other people, but like if I think of something and I want to do something cool, um, there's like a chamber in my brain that unlocks and like all of my inspirations from years of playing like fantasy video games and from watching fantasy movies and listening to like fantasy, like power metal and, uh, yeah, and, you know, stuff like that start pouring in. And then I'm like picking and choosing. It's sort of like, you know, those, uh, arcade games where you go into like the booth with all the money and the money starts flying around you and you have to get oh, as yeah. much money as possible. Yeah. So that booth is the creative process and you're standing in it and all of the dollars that are flying around you are different like ideas and plot points and like characters and dynamics and scenarios and whatever. And you're just grabbing all these different things um, and seeing kind of what sticks to that situation. Uh, I'm very chaotic. Truly, I am when it comes to when it comes to creating plots. What I could recommend is just take what you like. Like if you play the Elder Scrolls or if you like um, Lord of the Rings or really any other fantasy setting, um, mythos, legends, just take shit <laughs> and use yeah, it. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. It, um, I think we even discussed it on, uh, on the on the Q&A episode beforehand um, in terms of inspiration. Just just take things that you have enjoyed in your life in between video games and and movies and TV shows, um, music, like you said, even music, just like cool things that you've seen. It's like that is something that is impactful to me or interesting to me. And most likely, if it's if it especially if it's like not in the high fantasy like D and D style, your players are also gonna like that. So just constantly come up with cool ideas. Like a lot of a lot of my sessions have come from inspiration from things i like 
Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like these this massive battle that I was just talking about. I I tr- I the first thing I thought of was the, the Battle of the Bastards from Game of Thrones. I wanted something where it looked crazy and and huge and and it was just gritty and crazy. I that's how I originally got the idea of like I want to have a big battle because it's cool. It's cool, you know. Right. So it, it, you you take inspiration from what you love. That's that's really it, honestly. And don't be afraid to use tropes. Like they're nah. trope, they're tropes for a reason, you know. Yeah. Um. What about you, Mike? I, you both pretty much covered most of it. <laughs> I would also say, you won't have those moments of silence and pause if you run and write and tell a story that comes from your experiences and what you like and what you find uh, cool. But I would also caveat that by saying ingest a lot of things. Uh, Even if it's something you don't think you might not like, give it a shot. Even if it's something that's not in the genre that you're running in, still watch it. Give it a shot. Uh, You'd be surprised how often I've gotten ideas for fantasy by watching sci-fi or I've gotten ideas for uh, sci-fi by watching like an episode of the golden girls or something like you just yeah. you don't know where inspiration comes from. So try to ingest as much material from any genre, any medium, just in something in your brain. Like I kind of have part of my brain as partitioned to always be working on things like stories and worlds and just keep shoving shit into there. And sooner or later, you'll wake up from sleep and going, holy crap, a dark elf kidnaps the daughter of... And then you have an adventure. It'll just yeah. all meld together and happen eventually. Yeah. That's how it happens with me all the time. I'm like, I have this like general idea. Yeah. And like while I'm at work or something, like I'll be thinking about it. And like, oh, but wouldn't that be cool? But oh, shit, wouldn't, wouldn't that be cool? Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. And now, now I've created a whole entire session just by sitting there and thinking about it. I've, I've created whole sessions and NPCs by just on a whim, like, a quote pops into my head that I just make up, and I was like, who the hell said that? And I'm like, who would have said that? And then I just make something in my head of who would have said that? Why did he say that? Why did they say that? Why do they want to do what they do? And then, like, a whole NPC comes from that. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, uh, Eric, I hope that I hope that answered it the, be- the best that we could. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. and thank you so much for your question. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we really appreciate it. And if anyone listening has a question at all, ever, uh, we would be happy to answer it on any of our future podcasts. All you got to do is head over to our Facebook page, uh, Crit Holla uh, Dash D and D Memes. Uh, we're over there, and you can just answer or ask any question you'd like, and we'll answer it on the next podcast for sure, hundred percent. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, yeah, and just like we mentioned before about like D- DMs and players kind of bouncing ideas off of each other to to like create like a dynamic fun environment kind of the same thing with this podcast you know yeah like if you guys if this is D, right we're the dms and you guys the listeners are the players so like feel free to ask us questions and you know together we can create hopefully useful content um for any aspiring or veteran even uh dungeon master or player yeah exactly i learn from you guys every single time (laughs) yeah yeah, you, you two inspire me greatly. <laughs> oh, it's so cute. Oh, if I wasn't <laughs> on this rock right now, I'd hug you. <laughs> Have you just been on the rock the whole time? The whole time. It's pretty <laughs> destructive and desolate here. <laughs> it's pretty nasty. I think we should probably get out of here. Yeah, we should move on. I think we've camped long enough. This has been I a think so. yeah. This is a good long rest. I feel better. Okay. Yeah, you've been on that rock for almost an hour and a half now, so you've got to be tired. <laughs> I think it's time to pack up and head on out of here. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys so much for checking out the Crit Holla podcast. We really appreciate all of you, every single one of you. Um, you can check out our YouTube channel. Um, we post uh, top fives, uh, story time videos, um, reviews on uh, tabletop accessories, everything related to D&D. And we also post the video version of this podcast over here. Um, you can also check out our Facebook and Twitter, uh, which we post daily memes, plus give you updates of what's going on with us. Um, Stavi, do you have any plugs uh, today at all? Well, again, Dan, once um, once I get these uh, Kickstarter uh, backed items that I've that I've 
very patiently been waiting for to release. Um, I'm going to be doing like an unbox, maybe not an unboxing, but definitely like a first impression of uh, these items. What we have down the pipeline, just so you guys are aware, one of which actually already arrived, but I just not have had a chance to to um, really go through it and record any uh, video on it. Um, it was a successful Kickstarter. It was like four giant books of uh, campaign creation and like encounter creation, funny enough, um, by the name of Realm Fables. Uh, you, it's actually really, really cool. It's uh, from Shield Dice Studios. These guys make really great content, so I'm going to be doing a video on that at some point. I don't know when. Uh, but we also have the Old School Essentials. Um New box set that's coming out. I have the classic and the advanced uh, fantasy box sets, which was a massively successful Kickstarter. That should be coming out sometime this year. Uh, not necessarily D&D related, but it is tabletop RPG. We also have the Avatar The Last Airbender um, uh, tabletop RPG game that's coming out. My, my partner and I, we, we spent the big bucks on that one. <laughs> Um, the big boy bucks. The big boy dollars on that one. She she is a <laughs> massive Atla fan, like massive. Um, so as soon as that, that was announced, we were like, yes, we're going to go all in on it. That should be coming at some point too. So I'm probably going to do um, an unboxing and a review of that too, of all the goodies that come with it. Um, plus a couple of, of uh, magazines as well. There, there's, a, there's a few like D&D uh zines that i've backed that i'm still waiting to show up but aside from that not really a whole lot going on you'll you'll find me right here on the podcast with you guys um regularly hopefully every every time but yep yeah definitely <laughs> so and also warband gaming your youtube channel oh right that's a plug yeah that's a plug. no that is a plug i do have i do have a, i do have a youtube channel um warband gaming you guys can go ahead and check that out again that i haven't been very active on that mostly because of work um but i will be dabbling in stuff that is not necessarily uh gaming related uh at some point um there are other things that i've kind of been getting into at least not tabletop rpgs um started getting into other things and i, I kind of want to talk about that too but that's not that, that, that's not for a while. So yeah, yeah. All right, very good. And uh, Mike, as as always, we always oh, ask man. you. Oh <laughs> Me again. <laughs> <laughs> Me. Oh man. Well, I am part of the world famous Crit Hollow podcast. World and, famous. Um, world famous. World renowned. Yeah, all the world. Different planes <laughs> of existence, and you know. Yep, the whole nine. Crazy. Um. And uh, I'm, like, in the process of, of, like, writing some stuff to maybe do uh, story uh, videos or something or um, things of that nature. Maybe uh, I was thinking maybe it'd be cool to have, like, videos on how to, like, uh, introduce uh, horror into uh, your fantasy stories. Oh, hell yeah. Absolutely. And, like, things like that and genres of horror and things like that, since that seems to be my wheelhouse. And uh, things, you know, maybe like just let my mind explode on the YouTube channel and see what happens. Hell yeah. I'll, I'll be ready for that 100%. <laughs> we'll get that going for <laughs> sure. But all right. Well, thank you guys again so much for checking out the Crit Holla podcast. My name is Old Skit Flack, and we will see you in the next one. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. So why did we kill that guy? Why did we kill that guy? <laughs> I don't know. He was kind of annoying. I don't know. I just... Can I kick him real quick? I'm going to kick him real he quick. He had red eyes, dude. That's like a universal symbol of bad. Yeah. Yeah. You might. You can kick him. We didn't walk too far. We just went to another rock. He's right there. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go kick him. Yeah, go kick him. Go for it. It was squishy. Oh, my God. Leave it alone. <laughs> All right. Leave it alone. Come on. Here. Here. Let's go. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>